So where we ended last week was looking at the overlap in this case of our purely molecular system or purely atomic systems. So our linear combination of atomic orbitals, molecular orbital theory, this is effectively what a computer model would go through and do. So we're just looking at how the atomic orbitals interact to overlap. Okay. This is neat, and somebody brought up after class kind of an interesting issue that had never really crossed my mind, is that if we look at that very first interaction that we made, okay, we now have what kind of overlap of those p orbitals? What's the overlap coming over for those when they interacted with each other to make this one? Linear. Yeah, it's linear. Indirect or direct? Direct. direct? direct, which would mean what type of bond? Sigma. sigma. So we would end up with a sigma bond. Okay? We already kind of went through and addressed something about molecular orbital theory when we were looking at hybridization. When we did that, we said the direct overlap was a sigma bond because it was made by what? S-type orbitals. Is this an S-type orbital? No, this is directly a P orbital. Okay? So the hybridized model that we use to describe sigma and pi bonding is works. It's not the official system. Those naming systems are kind of artificial connections that we drew in class. Okay? This would be molecular orbital theory, which gets a lot more complicated. But it's the same kind of concept going in behind it. Just the addressal of those names doesn't quite work out as cleanly. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So when we looked at the PX, they could overlap where they were in phase or they could overlap where they were out of phase. Okay? So we end up with two molecular orbitals. That does become interesting and potentially a bit challenging, because if we look at the bottom one, we've increased the electron density between the atoms, which would suggest that that would be what kind of thing? If we have more electron density between atoms. A bond. Okay, so we would have what we could reference as a sigma bond because we have direct overlap. So we could call that as just a sigma. We move to the top case, what happens? They're now out of phase. Okay. This is still an orbital. This orbital exists for this molecule. Okay. We need to come up with some label for it. It is still involving the direct overlap of those orbitals. That direct overlap happened to be deconstructive, but it is still a direct overlap. So it's still a sigma type bond or a sigma type interaction. If we want to think about it in the bonding sense, did we actually make a bond? No. no if anything, the electrons don't exist now between the atoms. Okay? And this isn't just, oh, all the electrons can be there or cannot. They cannot be there. There's no choice. So this is worse than not a bond. This is actively not a bond. That makes this a sigma antibond. Anti okay? The labeling that we use with that is a sigma star. Because okay? antibond requires too much letters. So we could reference this as a sigma bond and a sigma antibond. Okay? That's just our labeling behind this. Okay? We put two orbitals in. Two px orbitals which means we're going to get two molecular orbitals, a bonding one and an antibonding one. And what happens if we move to the PY? Well, as we bring those two PYs together, there's the possibility where they are both in phase with each other, which means our electrons could kind of jump back and forth. So we now get a new molecular orbital where the electron is jumping back and forth. This is now a jump. So this would be an indirect overlap. So we would have to call this a pi bond because it's not a direct overlap. It's indirect. So we'll call that a pi bond. Did they have to be in phase? No. Nope. They could have been set up in the system where they were out of phase. Right? So the electrons then can't exist between the atoms. What's the result? 
we get an antibond. What type of overlap was that? An indirect, so we get a pi star or a pi antibond. We brought two atomic orbitals in. We ended up with one bonding and one antibonding. What happens if we look at the PZ? The exact same thing as the PY, okay, except different axis. So it's now tilted coming out at you. That's difficult to see, but what we end up with is another pi bond. I'm not going to attempt to draw it. Okay, and another pi antibond. Okay, so if we simplify this all out, what we end up with, I'm kind of drawing on that far right. Okay, how many atomic orbitals did we bring into this picture? Six. How many molecular orbitals did we end with? One, two, three, four, five, six. We end with the exact same number of molecular orbitals as we started with atomic orbitals. These are new orbitals, okay? and this is where things become challenging. I can place electrons into those orbitals. At this point, I haven't said anything about if there's a bond or not. Because to have a bond, what do I need? Electrons. electrons. Have I actually said there's electrons? No, I just said there's orbitals. The orbitals have these phases associated with them. So to predict something about whether or not there's a bond, I would have to know some more information, like how many electrons are going into this diagram. Okay. In that system, usually what we end up doing is kind of further simplifying this. And we would go one, two, three, four, five, six. And we now go through and label. Well, in this case, what would I expect? Would I expect a bond? Yes. Yeah, I put two electrons in. They put them into the lowest energy possible for that molecular orbital, which means that's a bond. Okay, what kind of bond would I expect there? A sigma bond, because it's going in at that sigma section. Yeah? What happens if I put in six total electrons? Two pi bonds. Okay, now two pi bonds, a sigma bond. What happens if I now put in eight? Now I have to start filling the anti-orbitals, okay, the anti-bonding. That starts to destabilize the bonding system. Depending on how many electrons I put in, the exact energy differences, I can entirely destabilize it so the molecule falls apart, okay, which is now going to change the entire molecular orbital diagram. Why would it change it? The molecule falls apart. Why would my molecular orbital diagram change? Literally not a molecule anymore. Right? So what I'm trying to do is effectively represent static points at beginnings and ends, and it doesn't do a good job of that transitioning on what's happening in between. We kind of make up things as that process goes through. Okay? This is a rather advanced version because this is looking at the strict linear combination of atomic orbitals as opposed to looking at the hybridized orbitals. The hybridized orbitals, I would argue, a little bit easier to understand because we can see those manipulations a little bit better. It matches better with our cheats for sigma and for pi. Yeah? Okay. I've got some black dotted lines being layered into, e into these. What am I representing with those? Those are the nodes where the electrons can exist. Notice as we go up in energy, typically what happens to the number of nodes? It increases. Okay? Nodes mean you can't exist as an electron. If you tell an electron, or even you, that you can't exist in certain locations, you start to get a little bit irritated and agitated. Okay? The more restrictions we put on your movement, the more energy you become, or the higher agitation you become. Unless you're an agoraphobic, but that's different. Right? Okay. We could go through and look at the hybridized lobes, but I think we did that already, so I'm going to kind of just say that's okay and move on. I'm going to accept that. If we looked at ethylene, C2H4, okay, the carbons are sp2 hybridized, 
So one of the things that could help us with our representation would be to draw out a Lewis structure. We would recognize that our carbons, each of them are sp2 hybridized relatively quickly because three groups of electrons. Okay. Common question I get and still get is they go, well, does a double bond count as more than one group? Like how many groups? Okay. <clears throat> Where I think that becomes problematic is how you were taught Lewis structure. Lewis structure is based off of squares. Why squares? That was the simplest shape that Lewis could work with. And what he noticed in his patterns is he noticed sets of eight. Why would sets of eight lead us to squares? Four sides, that's not eight. <coughs> Objects are three-dimensional, which means... You move to a cube, and what does a cube have? Eight, eight vertices, eight points. That becomes difficult to draw, so what did we do? We squished it into a square. So every time you draw a Lewis structure, there's an invisible square around it. When you go through to place your atoms, you're placing them on the faces of a square. When I go through to make a double bond, where are those electrons going? onto one face of that square. Okay. That's why it is one group of electrons. It's going into a single face. Okay. So it goes all the way back to the origins of how these things were built. That can help you predict those things. So we now have a hybridization, sp2, which means when we go through to look at our molecular diagram, we can reference the three sp2 hybrid orbitals Okay, in a plane. You'll notice these aren't all drawn in a plane. Those are the purple ones. Why are they not all drawn in the plane? What would happen if we drew them all on a plane? Sorry, had to. You didn't respond quickly enough, so. Right? There would be our three sp2 atoms on a plane, right? Right? Why would I want to turn that instead of looking at it from that view? What would be left over? P orbital. And where do I draw that P orbital? Be coming in and out of the plane at you. Okay. Sometimes to do that, we draw that on an angle. Oh, that would directly overlap that hybrid orbital that I drew. <coughs> so if we turn it on its edge a little bit, we can see a better representation of it. So there's that leftover p orbital, and then we get our sp2 hybrids, yeah? So when we look at how we would then describe this in our molecular system, okay, we're going to end up with bonding interactions. How many bonding interactions are we going to generate? Big questions. Let's try that again. How many sigma bonding interactions should we generate? Five, two, three, four, five. We've got one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. Yeah? So we'd get five of those sigma interactions. Okay? Every bonding interaction generates. an anti-bonding interaction. So not only will I have those five sigma, I'm also going to generate five sigma star, or our anti-bonding. <coughs> what else is going to get generated? That p orbital is floating through that system, which means I'm going to get one pi bonding and 1 pi antibond. How many total orbitals have I generated? There are 6 and 6, which is 12. Each carbon brings in times with the door. 4. 4. Each hydrogen brings in 1. How many atomic orbitals did I have? Twelve. Notice the orbitals match. Kind of, sort of? Okay. 
Is molecular orbital theory challenging? Yes, but it can also be used to describe a variety of the different interactions that we end up seeing and bonds that form and break. Okay? What I want you to do is get a basic idea behind it. Okay? It is something that if you're like, hell no, you could probably just accept it as one of those losses and just move on. Okay? We will constantly reference hybridization. We will constantly reference those orbitals and where they are located because it is where those things are located that is gonna drive how our reactions work further on down the road, okay? In those cases, you could just memorize how they worked instead of understanding how they worked. Yeah? Sort, okay. So there's all of our interactions. You'll notice that we will typically draw out the pi ones, but not the sigma ones. Why? The pi ones are higher in energy. If I'm going to look at an interaction, which of those electrons are the most likely to interact, the pi ones or the sigma? The pi ones, which means I care about where the pi ones exist, not the sigma. So if we're looking at a system with pi bonds, our focus is at the pi, not at the sigma. Interesting observation about sight. Okay? If you've been looking at the practice exam, there's a question about this. Okay? Sight is in reference to pi bonds. If we look at that bond, it's trans. If we look at this bond, it is cis. That rotation is forbidden. Okay? It is not allowed to happen. Okay? That's why we have to call one trans and one cis. That said, the whole reason we see is because that rotation happens. Okay? That rotation is happening in our eyes. Okay? So how is it allowed to happen? I heard reference as a mumble for a sigma bond. The sigma bonds are relevant because the pi bond is going to prevent that rotation. If I have a pi bond, it doesn't rotate. How does the rotation happen? Get rid of the pi bond. Okay? I would need that pi bond to break. To do that, there's a variety of ways I, I could bring more electrons in from the outside. Okay? Is, that what is that what is happening when we see? Electrons are bombarding our eyes. That would be bad. That's called beta radiation. Not good. That's not how we're visualizing. Okay? What is impacting our eyes? Is that what's allowing us to see? What is allowing us to see? Because we don't see UV light. What, what light are you seeing? Visible light. We're seeing visible light. Okay? Visible light has energy associated with it. That energy happens to match the gap in energy between the bonding and anti-bonding pi orbitals, which means when that light comes in, it takes that electron and it does what with it? It moves it to a higher energy. Why does that matter? Do I have that pi bond anymore? The net result is actually not bonding. Because it is not bonding, what is now allowed to happen? Free rotation. I can get the rotation, the electron relaxes back down to the ground state. Just the action of that molecule rotating is a physical change that we correspond to a color light impacting our eye. That's kind of cool. But that's what's happening inside our eyes. We're literally just exciting an electron from one orbital to another, and ta-da, we see stuff. Right? That's what's happening. A little simplified. But that's the primary driver. That's cool. Okay? That's molecular orbital. So there's a lot of power behind what they can show and do and explain. Okay. So big ones that we need out of this, sigma bonds. Rotations are relevant. Okay. Irrelevant is kind of a strong word there. Rotation is allowed. Okay. Not only allowed, it is expected. And okay. that makes things much more challenging for you because now not only do you have to deal with structures turning in three dimensions, just physically rotating them, but you also now have to wonder about the molecule doing the wave. 
as it does that wave, it's still the same molecule, but it's drawn differently. You have to acknowledge that they're the same structure. Okay? With our pi or our multibonds, we get rotation impossible. Okay? Is it impossible? No, it's possible as soon as you break the pi bond. Okay? But the pi bond, once it is formed, can't rotate. We would have to go through and break that. Right? Hybridization, the more orbitals involved, it goes to a higher energy. Why? Why more hybridization, higher energy? What would be not hybridized at all? S, awesome. What would be hybridized a lot? SP3. Why would SP3, whoa, SP3 be higher in energy than S? It is more p orbitals. The p orbitals are higher in energy than the s. The more you put in a higher energy orbital, what happens? It goes up in energy. Okay? Okay? Less electronegativity. Why? Your p orbitals are further from the nucleus than the s orbitals. That's that energy gum jump. Okay? The further it is from the nucleus, the less it's holding it. By definition, there's electronegativity. Okay? Kind of make sense? So those are the big things. Okay. <clears throat> we will come back to it. Um, but for the most part, what we're really concerned about is where is the electron density located. Okay. I do want to address one thing with molecular orbitals. If we just looked at a carbon-chlorine bond, because this is kind of neat, let's make the carbon sp3 hybridized. And we'll make our chlorine sp3. Whoa, that was an awful looking sp3. Promise, I'm not intentionally trying to change their shape. If we went through and looked at the diagram, right, lots of overlap in between. Oops. Versus not. If I look at that bond, two electrons go in. They go into the lowest energy, so we make a bond. If I now want to break that carbon-chlorine bond, what could I do? Okay. I could somehow get electrons into the antibond. I could try and do that by exciting electrons okay. from the sigma bonding to the sigma antibonding. Turns out that energy gap is a hard one to obtain. Okay. That's really high energy. We can do it, but it requires lots and lots of energy. Why was the pi a smaller energy gap? What orbital was this? SP3. SP3. Why was the pi a smaller gap? What's the difference between an SP3? What orbital made a pi bond? What orbital made a pi bond? A p orbital. Which is higher in energy, a p orbital or an SP3? A p. The SP3 uses an s orbital. Which by default is lower in energy. The pi are higher in energy, or the p orbitals are higher in energy, which means the pi bonding and antibonding are also going to be higher in energy. That gap now shrinks. Okay? So getting a sigma jump is not super likely to happen. So we don't get light to have this happen. What do we, we need? We need another atom to supply electrons. So another atom would come in and try and put electrons into this. Where's the easiest place for it to put those electrons? Just trying to break that bond. Where's the easiest place to place those electrons? As a hint, there's only two places identified so far, and one of them already has electrons in it. Referencing an S doesn't work because we're looking at a molecule. There is no S anymore. We have a sigma bonding and we have a sigma antibonding. Where do we place the electrons? In the sigma antibonding. Okay. Where's their large space to place those electrons? Where's the largest lobe for our antibonding? Okay. 
on the carbon or chlorine away from the bond, right? Okay. What would be away from my front? My back, also known as my back side. For those of you that have taken a little bit of OCHEM, that might be starting to ring some bells. When we look at some chemistry of trying to break that bond, that thing coming in and attacking this is going to attack from the backside. Why? There's a freaking orbital back there to place electrons into. Which one is it going to place them into, the chlorine or the carbon? Which one do you think already has tons of electrons in it? The chlorine, which means what happens if our attacking thing tries to put electrons into the chlorine? It can't. So where does it place the electron? Onto the carbon, the back side of the carbon. So when we get into reactions, we'll reference the backside attack. Why are we attacking the backside? Because there's a freaking orbital right there that I can place electrons into. Molecular orbital theory actually tells me where the attack is going to happen. Okay? There's other hand wavy things we can do that don't involve molecular orbital theory, and we will use those. Okay? <coughs> But here's that introduction to it. The backside attack is facilitated because the antibonding orbital has a giant lobe there where I can place the electrons into. That's kind of cool. Hi. You guys done with molecular orbital theory? Yes. Okay, cool. So, nomenclature. Yay. <laughs> there are tons of rules for nomenclature. Okay. If we look at the, the manual for nomenclature, it is literally larger than your textbook, okay, as far as thickness, all dimensions. The paper is onion leaf paper, larger than your textbook, okay? So there are tons of rules when it comes to nomenclature. In that book, they also give examples, so it's not just a list of rules, okay? But there are tons of rules. When it comes to nomenclature, you either know the rule or you don't. If you know the rule, nomenclature is really incredibly easy. So I got people going, I didn't think I'd like nomenclature better than Lewis structure, but here I am. That's because you knew the rule. <laughs> if you don't know the rule, you're dead in the water. There's nothing to do. Okay? What's on this slide is all of the stuff that you should have memorized, and that will solve maybe 70% of what you can expect. Okay? So if you've got that nailed down, you're pretty good to go. Okay? There's still at least 30% of exceptions. Okay? Because I need you to see that. Smart work has a lot of those. Sorry. Okay? But that's why it's there, is to build you and get you exposure to those rule sets. Okay? So first and foremost, we've got lots of different functional groups. Each of those functional groups needs a characteristic name so that we can identify it. Okay? Depending on which functional group, we're going to change the name. Okay? But if we change, the, and what if multiple functional groups are in the same structure? Which one drives the name? We need a priority. Okay? This priority is not perfect. It includes most of the ones that you would encounter. There's tons of other functional groups out there. Okay? But what this provides is roughly how you would name it. Notice your halides don't have a suffix. That's because they are so low in priority, we will never, never name a halogen-containing compound by the halide. We'll name it based off of the rest of the compound and then say the halogen is a substituent as part of it. Okay? So there is no suffix. It's only prefixes. You notice the same thing for our ethers. That's, again, big, massive air quotes on it. Okay, usually, they're named as a prefix, not as a suffix. Okay? Then we start with our alkanes. If all you have are carbons, the suffix is ane. What if there's a higher priority functional group? Well, the ending needs to change. But the alkane, what I would argue is that these alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes are kind of a reference of hybridization okay, through the backbone. So I want to look at that backbone and decide of my carbon structure. Is it primarily sp3? Well, that's alkanes. So my ane ending shows up. So it still goes into my suffix, but it's not the end. Notice there's another dash there, right? The alkene, whoop, alkene, same kind of deal. The alkyne, same kind of deal. 
They're inserted as suffixes at the end, okay, with a potential to change that E part to something else. That's what the rest of these things are. So to the left of that arrow says this is the suffix, that's the highest priority thing there. To the right of that arrow means there's something more important there. How does that change the name? Sometimes it's changing the name by changing the suffix. Notice dash dash. Those are suffix changing. Yeah? Everybody know what I mean by suffix? Yeah? Okay. What happens when we move up to the amines, alcohols, ketones, etc.? Very clearly a suffix, because clearly, because we have the dash in front, which means the ending is our suffix. What happens when we go through the arrow? The dash goes to the end. There's not <laughs> one in front of it. It just goes to the end, which means it became a prefix. So we're oscillating between suffixes and prefixes depending on priorities. Kind of, sort of? I think I even heard an odd Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> that was just the simple stuff. Yes? So if something has more priority than the other one, could the one that has more priority will change to the uh, suffix? Prefix. Okay. So the pre parts of your name are substituents. Those are pieces. Okay. Which gets a little bit weird. When we think of a name, what's the most important part of someone's name? Okay, last name. Okay. Depending on what you're using it for. For nomenclature's sake, the most important part is the last. The first part is an addition on top of it. So I am McFavlin with the addition being Mike. Okay. Nomenclature for chemistry molecules are pretty much the same thing. What is the primary family group? And then as a prefix, we append that extra information. Kind of, sort of? Okay. Organic chemistry is about carbons, so we have to be able to specify how many carbons. That's all of our prefixes. Okay? That's the alk part of a name. So meth, eth, pro, bute, pent, hex, pent, or hept, oct, non, dec, undec, dodec, tridec, maybe tetradec. And then I think I'm out of options. Okay? You should know 1 through 10. All you need is OCHEM 1. You're probably OK up to hex. Okay? OCHEM 1 tends to venture into the heptox non every so often. Okay? But most of our structures are going to be six carbons or less. Okay? So you need to know when you hear meth, you know one carbon. When you hear butte, four carbons. Okay? That requires the practice of naming behind that. For whatever reason, I was taught that in high school and it stuck with me. So if you ask me about it, you'll see me go through and count them out. Meth, bet, meth, eth, pro, bute, pent. Okay? And I count them on my hand. I don't know why, just it's a reflex. Okay? So you need to know those. In blue here is our next big section. When you look at a structure, the biggest thing is find the longest carbon chain. That contains the highest priority functional group. Because we can have really long carbon chains that don't contain the highest priority functional group. What's the most important thing? The highest priority functional group. So I could change the name from a, to be 10 carbons to now only two carbons, because the longest chain only had two carbons with the high priority functional group. Okay? So be careful with that. Identify your highest priority functional groups and all of your substituents. Then you need to define the location for each of them by using the smallest number to your highest priority first. Okay? Tie, use the smallest overall numbers. Could you get a tie again? People have done the smart work. Yes, yes you can. What breaks that tie? <coughs> the alphabet. Okay? So now you have to know numbers, you also have to know your alphabet. Multiple things I'm not good at. Okay? Then you have to put everything together. Okay? The name goes together in alphabetical order regardless of the number system. So you go number, substituent, number, what if you have multiple substituents? You have to define the location for each and every substituent, which means number, comma, number. Okay? 
Name your substituent. Sometimes you'll see parentheses. The reason there are parentheses is because you have complex substituents. Right? So a parenthesis means you have a nomenclature question inside a nomenclature question. Okay? So you have to be able to address that independently. Avoid spaces as much as possible and just assemble the whole string of stuff. Okay? Cyclic structures, you have to throw in the word cyclo. Okay? Sometimes we'll name the cyclic structure as a substituent. Sometimes we'll name it as the primary functional group. Why? Because somebody said so. Okay? How do you know which is which? You memorized the rule that said so. Okay? Excited? So I know I'm not. Yes? Anything but the highest priority functional group in that compound? Yes. So a substituent is anything that is not the highest priority functional group in that particular compound. Should we look at some examples? Yes. Cool. So first thing to do would be to identify the main chain right, that also includes the highest priority functional group. Where this can become extra tricky is do they have to give you a structure? No. Nope. You could have been given a formula, which means you have to interpret it from the formula. Usually a good first step would be drawing it out, okay, so that you have that structure. Let's take a look at those top two, right? We've done a little bit better with those. Are those the same or different? Okay, we got a little mix there. Most people said same, some people said different. If we said different, it's probably because I tried to overlay this one on top of the other one. So if I went through, oh, that overlays perfectly not. So it must be different because they don't completely overlap. Okay? But if you took a picture of me okay, and then took a picture of me again, would those two pictures perfectly overlap? Yes. <laughs> no, unless I'm dead, in which case, the, hopefully. Okay? Right? As people are thinking about that one. <laughs> Okay. Our structures can spin, flip, and rotate. We have the rotation of a sigma bond. That's what happened here. I rotated that sigma bond. That rotation does not make them unique. It's still the same structure. Nomenclature helps us to identify those differences if you were really good at nomenclature. I never was, so I had to deal with the spatial stuff. So identify the main chain. Circle all of the carbons in your main chain. Okay, is there anything outside that circle? No, so this is a super easy one. Okay, how many carbons are in that main chain? Four, so I get butte. What is the hybridization in that backbone? Those are all sp3, so we'll call that butane. Do I need numbers? Nope, there's nothing out of the priority list that's going to change anything there. What happens when I move to the other one? It's still four carbons, it's still bute, it's still all sp3 hybridized, it's still butane. Okay. The names are the same, which would suggest that the structures are the same. Okay. That rule becomes tricky because if you don't know nomenclature perfectly, you'll screw up the name and write the same name for two compounds when they are. Okay. So be careful just saying, oh, I'm just going to memorize nomenclature. Right. How about the bottom two? Okay. One's, a, one's, a one's a ring. Okay, so let's jump to that one. We got a ring, so we could just circle that ring. What we have to be careful is, is the ring more important than the substituent, or is the, substi or is the other piece more important than that? So we've got two pieces here. How many are in the red? How many in the blue? Four. I think, Toby, you were saying I missed that? No? Okay. I thought I heard something else. So, which one's higher priority? Our red. So, how many carbons? So, pent. For those of you jumping to names, that's okay. What I'm trying to do is slow that just a little bit. Okay? What is the hybridization of all of those carbons? SP3. So, that would be? 
ain. Okay? It is cyclic, so I need to call that cyclopentane. Now I can take a look at the, at the blue part. Okay, that blue part is now a substituent. This one becomes tricky because that substituent isn't just a straight chain. If we look at that blue part, it's actually three carbons with a substituent. So this is a substituent with a substituent. Okay. So what is the blue part? How many carbons? Three. So that would be pro. For those people, again, they were jumping to names. If we said propane, that's ending the structure. It can't be ended because that's a substituent. How do I differentiate the name of the substituent from the name of the root? I identify it's a substituent by throwing in the YL. That's the point of the YL. It's saying it's a substituent. It's part of your larger structure. Okay? What is the black substituent? So one carbon, so that's a meth, ol, because it's a substituent. It's a substituent of the substituent. Okay? So where is the substituent of the substituent? It's at the end of the chain? Okay, it's somewhere in the middle. This chain didn't really matter which way we numbered because we'd get the same answer. But we have to be careful with that. Within the substituent, the numbering by default starts where it is connected to the main chain, which means one, two, three. How do I know that? It's a rule. It's what it is. Where is the methyl located? Two methyl propyl cyclopentane. Putting it all together, I already forgot the name, propyl. Notice there's a space in there. Delete it. Shouldn't be there. Okay. So if I read this out, 2-methylpropyl cyclopentane, that might be a bit weird because this 2-methyl, that 2 is referring to what? The second carbon. The second carbon on what? The cyclopentane? No, it's referring to it on the propyl. I need to make sure my language disambiguates that as much as possible. How do I do that? That's the point of the parentheticals. I have found that that is not consistently used. Okay? Why not? If I said 2-methylpropyl cyclopentane, did I specify where the propyl was located? No, why not? Because the propyl was the main chain, the methyl was a substituent on said substituent main chain of that. Yeah, it's really stupid. This is why you should put the parentheticals on it. It disambiguates everything nicely. Okay? So we have a substituent. Red parenthetical on cyclopentane. What did I say about our substituents? What do we always have to do? Identify their location. Have I identified the location of the 2-methylpropyl? Where is it located? By default, position 1. So this whole goofy-ass name is 1-methyl... 1-parenthetical, 2-methylpropyl, parenthetical, cyclopentane. What happens if you put a space in the wrong place? It's wrong. What happens if you put a comma in the wrong place? It's wrong. What happens if you don't put in the parentheses? It's wrong. Okay. When it comes to online homework systems, they are amazingly good at grading this to your detriment. Go through and take a look at the nomenclature. You'll find that at best I asked one question for you to write out the name. Okay. With the hope being that you would attempt it and get insanely frustrated with it. When it comes to nomenclature, it will only be multiple choice. They are virtually impossible to nitpick the details of grading in a short answer. They will only show up as strictly multiple choice. Kind of, sort of? Do the first one. You got a question? How we went through and did it? 
Nine times out of ten, this is what happens. Students go through and say, okay, here's the longest carbon chain. Oh, actually, there's two there. One. Okay, so actually, whoops, we got to backtrack. So actually, it was this one. They go like, yes, I didn't fall in the trap. I made sure to get those two carbons as opposed to that one carbon I made the longer chain. Yep. Well, it's true. You didn't fall in that trap. The trap you did fall in was reading it from just left to right, top to bottom. Because if we go back, whoops. If we go back to the beginning, this is one, two versus one, two, three. Okay. So when we're looking at these structures, they are not going to be represented where the longest carbon chain is in a straight right line left to right. It's just not going to happen. Okay? If, you, if it does happen on a test, you should immediately be like, oh crap, I'm doing something wrong. Okay? Because the average person with no knowledge, that's how they would do it. Okay? So if you luck into a correct answer, that's a bad question. So most questions are written to prevent that from happening. Okay? So our longest carbon chain is now what? I'm trusting you guys put that together right. That's our non. Those were all singly bonded, so ain. Okay? And just talking with everybody around the class, they, someone looked at that structure and said, there's no double or triple bonds, it's an ain. Was that allowed? Yeah. Okay? The exact sequence in which we find those pieces isn't of critical importance. Recognizing that those pieces are all there is very important. Okay, so we have a non-ain. What are the substituents? Well, I have one here, I have one here, and I have one here, yeah? Okay, starting left to right, what do I have? Two carbons, so I have an ethyl, bottom one. Again, two carbons, so I have an ethyl. I have a new carbon here, so I'll switch that color up to get me a methyl for one carbon. Okay, I've now got the basic pieces down. I did hear people starting to shout out, we've got two ethyls, so that means it's going to be a diethyl. So we could modify that right now and say this is a diethyl. Okay, And we could start to underline the pieces, because this is roughly what I would do. Okay. Those pieces I need to assemble. I need to specify the location for each of these. Cool. I thought I fell into an issue. So to define the location, I have to start numbering. Because it's a chain, my numbering can start left to right or right to left. Most people read left to right, which probably means it's wrong. The numbering probably makes sense to go right to left. Not a guarantee. Okay? But if we check it out, we go 1, 2, 3 versus 1, 2, 3, 4. What am I referencing at those points? Because notice I'm stopping in each of those cases where the first substituent appears. I want a number so that my first substituent gets the lowest number. Why? Because some dude said that's the rule. <laughs> Right? So my numbering needs to go 1, 2, 3, right to left. 1, 2, 3, 4. Hopefully I don't lose any carbons along the way. 6, 7, 8, 9. My methyl was located at position 3. My ethyls were located at position 4 dash. Whoops. Yep, thank you. 4 comma 6 dash diethyl. Okay. Now to put it all together, I have to organize them alphabetically. Okay. The alphabet is not going to reference the dye. It's going to reference the E of ethyl. In this case, it didn't really matter because both D and E come before M. So my whole name, I'm not writing it out, 4,6-diethyl-3-methyl-none-A. Okay. When showing work, that's what I would show to put that together, and then I would look at my multiple choice answers to see which one came closest. I wouldn't actually bother to write out the whole name because it's a multiple choice and the answer is literally there. All I gotta do is see which order aligned. Yes? 
So numbering the chain, in this case, I wanted the smallest numbers used. In a ring. So in the ring, how would we number it? Our substituent, our highest priority substituent gets the lowest number. In this case, there was only one substituent, so I'm starting at position one by default. Okay. What happens if I throw on another substituent? Now the OH is located at position one. Why does the OH get position one? It's a higher priority functional group than this one. Now which one? Okay. Which is a higher priority, a carbon or a carbon? There, there isn't a priority difference there, so how do we differentiate that? Alphabet. Okay, we'll jump to the alphabet. This is methyl, and this one was propyl. Which one comes first? Methyl, which means the methyl's at position one. Which is higher priority? And this I apologize for because it's kind of a typo on the slides. Alkynes or alkanes versus halides have the same priority. It goes back to alphabet again. The bromine takes the priority. Yes? Is something about atomic mass? Atomic mass? I understand atomic mass. Um, I'm going to actually say stop watching that video. Stop <laughs> watching. <laughs> and, not, and not because it's bad. It's too late. It is useful information that will probably show up in unit two. I don't think we're going to get to it this unit. Okay. So it's probably going to be where we start unit two. That wasn't one of the YouTube videos you told us to watch. I know. Because it's nomenclature. <laughs> we should have gotten there. That doesn't mean we will. In fact, we probably won't. Okay? Kind of, sort of? Can you clarify which of these probably substituents not. are all on the same priority list or have the same level of priority? So substituents that have the same priority, halides, alkanes, Ethers, ethers. Them I think I know on the list, but I think ethers, halides, alkanes, alkynes, alkynes are higher priority. Nitros. I think nitros are the same priority. Yeah, I, I and I do greatly apologize for when it comes to nomenclature because I I really don't think it's worth my brain power. Which, considering I'm writing three quarters of your tests, right? If it comes down to that, can we have, like in that situation, if we picked the one on the list that's higher instead of going out the order, what's that look like? Like if we're going by this list and that's how we're studying. Because that's what I would have done. Oh, what would you have selected for an answer? Um, yeah. I, Probably not going to ask that question for that very reason. <laughs> okay. So, watch out for your rotations. Rings are their own chain, and rings are not part of a chain, okay, which was addressed up here at the front. When we looked at numbering these, this is one, two, three, four, five, yeah? Question came up saying, well, isn't this chain actually four carbons? One, two, three, four. Okay. Really, all that's going to come down to is what's the rule? The rule says no. One, two, three. A collection of people. Okay, so it's not one person. So rings are not part of your chain. Those are differentiated. You don't double count atoms. Okay. So what's in a name? I like this slide for the top part because what it's doing is color coding each of those pieces okay, behind it. Okay? So all three of these names are wrong, okay, which is great because when you look at all three of those names, what would you immediately say? 
don't they look good and pretty? Yeah, they're all wrong. Okay, so the question becomes is why are they wrong? Okay, to figure out that why is usually helpful to draw what you've got. So let's take a look at that first one. What do we have? Okay. I would argue you would jump into that last part to identify it. So we're looking at a hex. Two, four, six. It says ain, so they're all sp3 hybridized. I've already drawn it that way, so I'm good to go. Okay, then what does it say? I have methyls. In fact, I have two methyls. Where are those methyls located? Well, it says position three. Notice that I will probably number left to right. If this was a multiple choice test, which way should I number? Right to left. Why? Because the answer choice is probably showing it inverted. Does that make sense? Most likely. So at three, I have a methyl. There's my methyl. It then says dimethyl, so I need a second methyl. To identify that second methyl, what would I need? I would need another number. And a comma. Okay? That number's not there. Whoever wrote this probably was thinking 3,3 three, three, dimethyl hexane. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> and so not intentionally, actually. That's why the note is there. All of these are wrong, and these were all intended to be valid practice. Yeah, I freaking hate nomenclature. Okay? So with that adjustment of making it a 3-3, now we can come to an appropriate name. Make sense? Son. So 3-dimethyl, saying it once is wrong. Saying it once is wrong. <laughs> That's the rule. Okay. What happens when we move to the next one? 3-dimethyl cyclohexane. Okay. If we go through again, we've got a 6-carbon chain because of the hex. We do should check really quickly for our shape. The shape is saying cyclo, so let's make it a ring. There's a hexane. Okay. All single bonds, so that's already specified. Dimethyl, so I've got a methyl. Where? I heard a lot of people say three. Check that again. Where should the methyl go? Position one. Why? It's a ring. Your substituents, by definition, go at position one to start your ring. So there's the methyl. So already that number is a bad idea. That should have been a one. Then it says dimethyl. And now we could be like, well, what were they trying to show? Were they trying to say that we had two methyls? Or were we trying to go with? Whoops. Sorry. Let me align that a little better. Or were we trying to go with a 1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane? See why it's important to specify each of those pieces of information. Okay? So in the first one where we had to specify each one, three, three, you might say, well, isn't that redundant? It is redundant when it's the same number. What if it's a different number? Now it's not redundant. So if you just say, oh, we specify for every single one, you don't lose that information accidentally. Okay? So it's actually kind of a good thing that you do the redundancy behind. This would be one of those cases. Yes? So on a ring, by definition, your first or your primary substituent goes in at position one, always. Okay? The next substituent goes to the lowest number in our counting cycle. Okay? So in the first case, that should have been a one, one. I can't believe I'm writing out this stupid, I hate it. freaking, right? 1,1 one, one dimethyl cyclohexane. The second case would have been 1,3 dimethyl, that says cyclohexane. Ish? Couldn't it have been 1,5? Right? One, two, three, four. Isn't that one, five? 
I want the lowest numbers possible. So we'll go one, three, not one, five. Make sense? It's either like me, they didn't like numbers. That is my one happy saving grace for nomenclature. They went smaller numbers. And the rest of it's crap. So far? Last one? So this one becomes a little bit more challenging because it's not just alkanes, right? So we still have that hex, one, two, three, four, five, six, but now we have an alcohol. Where is that alcohol located? Position two. That OL, I would have to know the OH. Notice I'm doing left to right. Is it allowed to go right to left? Yep. Okay. That's up to you to decide which one you want to preference when looking at multiple choice answers and how you want to go through and solve. Okay. It is still ane, so they're all singly bonded, sp3 hybridized, so that's good. We then run into the stupid same issue again with that dye issue. Okay. So what we could do... Oh, never mind. We can't do that yet, because then the name would be right. We said that was supposed to be wrong. So we've got a 3-methyl. Okay, so at the 3 position, right, there's the methyl, right? 1, 2, 3. Why not? Once you've numbered, you can't switch numbering. Okay? What was that? Yeah, I could have. Okay. So we've got the three referencing the methyl. We have that stupid dye floating out there again, which was probably referencing the methyl, but probably forgetting about the redundancy and maybe needed that 3-3, and that would be our mistake, that we didn't specify that extra piece. Make sense? Kind of getting ideas? Okay. What do you got, Daniel? <laughs> In this case, remember, placement of the OH left to right ultimately doesn't matter. Okay, It's going to come down to whichever you prefer to look at the structure from. Because you know you're looking at these as multiple choice, and <coughs> most people read left to right, the multiple choice answers will probably read it actually right to left, right? as a lo larger percentage of the time. Not always, but you're probably looking 60, 70% of the time, them reversing the standard way you would read. Right? Because they don't want people to accidentally get the answer right. So the other way we could have looked at this structure, six, that would have worked. Yeah? So does that. So someone started to predict out. There are multiple ways that we could spin, flip, or rotate this structure and get the exact same answer. But it looks different. You have to watch out for those differences. You're responsible for knowing they're all the same. Yes, Asana. What if your dimethyls were flipped and like you were looking at OH and dimethyl on the bottom? Since you said on the bottom, let's try to see if I can pull that one off. Most people are like, oh my god, what the hell? It's the exact same structure. We just rotated a different bond. Okay? So we have to be careful and cognizant of that. Chapter 4 <coughs> talks about that a little bit. Okay? There is some more practice here. Depending on how we feel about that on Wednesday. Uh, or actually, I'm going to argue next Monday, we can come back and look at nomenclature. Okay? Um, but for my purposes, I think we should advance on. Um, this is fun. This was a random example, and someone was like, how do you know which one comes first? And I was like, I don't know. So I had to look it up. 2.2.3. Z over E. Do you have any idea what Z and E are? No. Don't worry about it. We'll worry about it later. 
Hi. It is mentioned in the YouTube video. It's not relevant yet. Hi. Why is this all super exciting and fun? We're now done with chapter one, two, three, and at least one of our nomenclature chapters. This is now chapter four. Yay, butanes. C4, H10. Okay. Why would we call it butanes? What's the question? Chapter four will be on exam one. Chapter five is borderline. We'll, we'll see what happens. Some of it is going to be there, but it'll be limited. Probably one to two questions, multiple choice only. Why S? There are multiple ways that we could arrange four carbons. Right? Four carbons. That doesn't count. Why does that one not count? It's the exact same. So that doesn't count. How else could I arrange four carbons? There are multiple ways that I could arrange four carbons to match that formula. Okay. So there's multiple butanes possible. Okay. So we have to be aware of that when we're looking at our structures. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes? So that other one wasn't correct because the sigma bond can rotate now. Sigma bonds are allowed to rotate. That would be like me moving my arms. I'm still Mike. You know, if I was moving my finger, maybe it would change that name. But that's okay. <laughs> That's only if you made a mistake on the road. Define the relationship between those structures. What would you call? Same, different. Different. How about that one? Same or different? Different. Is that one different from the first one in a way that is different that the second one is different from the first one? Okay, yes? What's that yes? Has an extra... Mm, I may have kind of given away an answer. Uh, not enough. Because this has a methyl too. Extra carbon I'd accept a little bit better. Okay? There are five carbons versus four versus four. So if I call the first two different, what am I going to have to use or invent to describe the last one? I can't still call it different because it's different for a different reason. <laughs> Understanding why we need a different word than different. Yeah? Cool. Okay. The referencing that comes into this is now just how do we classify these things. So we end up with a couple different categories. Not the same categories. Different. The molecular formulas are different. Okay? <laughs> so when we look at the last one, its molecular formula would be <laughs> C5H whatever. The middle one is C4. First one, C4. Okay? So that last one I can classify as different from the other two because the formulas are different. Okay? Or the formulas are not the same. So isn't that no longer butane? It's also no longer butane. Identical. The formulas are the same and the structures are superimposable. Are any of those superimposable? Can I lay any of them on top of each other? And using hands gets a bit dangerous, but we'll, we'll start with that for this chapter and chapter five. We'll say that was a bad idea. Okay, if we took our hands, do they superimpose over the top? Yes. Okay. At least at a first blush, right? They superimpose? Okay. <clears throat> That's what we're referencing by superimposal. Can you overlay the structures on top of each other and everything match? So if I took this four carbons, to overlay, I would need something there, right? Can this carbon move to that position? No, why not? It would break that bond. So those don't overlay. Those are non-superimposable. Okay. If we went to the last one, look, it, it superimposes, doesn't it? But it's missing a piece. So it also doesn't superimpose.
New structure to the left in blue. Does that superimpose with the red structure? So we go ding, ding. Oh, it would have to lay out there, right? But there's no bond out there. Could it superimpose? Yes. Rotate that bond. This one comes up there. The blue falls in line. Those are superimposable. When you drew them, did they look superimposable? No. no. That would be kind of like in your hands. Like, oh, they're superimposable. Really? Those don't superimpose, right? You can move your finger, dude. Put your finger back up. Or down. Okay? Now they're superimposing. So those motions are things that you have to consider when trying to classify things. Isomers will have identical molecular formulas and not superimposable. So if we look at all of our classifications, and this is where we'll end, those two would be identical. These two, that's a horrible arrow, whatever. <coughs> Isomers. And even these two, or going that direction. Different. Kind of, sort of? So what we're now looking at in this chapter is how do we overlay multiple different structures and recognize that we have the ability to rotate sigma bonds and all that fun stuff. Okay.